Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. My name is uh, Daniel Acuna. Uh, I'm an assistant professor here in the iSchool. Hello, everybody who is here uh, live. Um, and I, uh, I guess I've been here for, for some years now, and I do research in uh, many areas, but mostly in trying to understand science. And a lot of the things that I will present today or I will talk about today, I use in my own research. So, um, and I, today I will present about applied uh, deep learning. I teach uh, two courses primarily, big data analytics, where we use, uh, we try to understand why big data is so popular, uh, what kind of value can, uh, it can bring to your uh, organization, and apply deep learning, uh, where we look at uh, software packages and things that we can use directly in, in many different kinds of, of, um, of modes of media, images, text, and things like that. So first, if I can go to the next slide, please. Uh, I'd like to just acknowledge uh, the help of many colleagues and, um, and students who, uh, have, uh, who helped me uh, in my research. I run the Science of Science Computational and Computational Discovery Lab here. And, um, and here's a sample of, of the funding. So thank you very much to the funders. And I just wanted to start by just saying the, the final message of this talk, which is uh, I believe deep learning offers a tremendous opportunity to businesses uh, because of any size and any industry. Uh, and it, that's shifted from, from some years ago where most of the uh, value uh, was uh, being uh, uh, taken advantage of by big companies. Instead of today, I think any business of any size can take advantage of this new technology. And the idea is that uh, we can uh, use the data that your organization produces. Um, I guess I can remove these. <laughs> I'm just too conditioned to use a mask everywhere. I probably sleep with masks. Um, so you can use the data sets that your organization produces for um, for, and analyze them with these kinds of technologies. And also, we have these software packages that allow you to, uh, to download uh, models and, and, uh, and, and, and techniques that have been developed by big companies so you can take advantage of that. Now, the key, in my view, is that your organization needs to have the right kind of data scientists, uh, the right kind of um, understanding that it's, just not, it's not just developing and getting the data, but it's also the infrastructure around using this technology. So it offers a lot of opportunities and a lot of limitations too. Not everything can be solved with deep learning, so you have to be careful about that. And lastly, but uh, perhaps even more importantly, moving forward is that a lot of these technologies that I will talk about today hide complexity and they hide ethical issues. Uh, and that has uh, implications uh, in the legal dimension and, and uh, ethical dimensions too. I don't, I don't know what time it is, but uh, please let me know if I run out of time. Um, all right, so machine learning and deep learning historically have been used by big technology uh, tech, tech companies, you know, Google, the usual, the usual suspects, Google, Facebook, and things like that. Um, and um, if, you, if you look at what they say about how they use AI and how much uh, AI kind of trickles down into the organization to drive up revenue, uh, a, a recent survey showed that uh, for almost a fifth of them, uh, they see an increase of 6 to 10% in revenue improvement through the use of AI and machine learning. Uh, and COVID just, uh, has just accelerated this because you don't have uh, interactions. You don't have really, uh, a lot of times you can just skip many steps uh, when you're trying to sell a product or a service. And then you can use AI to try to replace many of the steps that usually took place in the real world. So. This has just accelerated over the last two years. So let me just give you an example of what I mean by this. So uh, I'm sure you are all familiar with uh, the process of buying houses. Um, and that's uh, a very, I mean, traditionally it's a very long process where you, you have an agent, you go and look at many various houses, um, and then you, you say, okay, this house is great. I, I totally see living here. Um, and you say, okay, I'm gonna offer this amount for this house, even though the owner is saying, okay, you should pay you know, $20, you say, okay, I'm gonna pay $19. Um, 
and then there is a negotiation process with the agent. This is very complicated, and it takes, you know, it might take several days. I don't know about these days, but maybe in the past, usually it takes, you know, several, sometimes weeks. Um, but if you think about it, it's a very convoluted process, and there is a lot of uncertainty from, from everybody. Like, it's a very mysterious process. But ultimately, what you would really like is to try to say, okay, what is the final selling value of the house. Like after all of this back and forth, you want to say, okay, I think this house is gonna be sold at this price. So maybe the buyer can say, okay, I'm gonna offer the final value. And the buyer will say, okay, that seems fair. So they, they, they agree and the, the deal can be, can be closed in 10 seconds instead of being a two week uh, process. Now, um, the process is mysterious, but if you think about it uh, with websites such as Zillow, uh, they have a lot of data about this, about many, many places in the country, many kinds of houses that uh, have been uh, bought and sold um, of all kinds, some shapes uh, from different buyers. So if you think about it, they have a lot of features about the house. Okay, so you, in, in real estate, people talk about location, but it's a lot of other stuff. When you go on and, and look at a place, even to rent, you click at the pictures, so the picture is giving you some information about the house, how nice it looks, how much light you get from outside. And there are all these kind of set of things that you use mysteriously in your brain for predicting how much you're gonna offer. Okay, so if it looks outdated, you say, ah, that's, that asking price is crazy, so I'm just gonna offer something lower. Or if it looks great and, it, and the neighborhood looks great, you might make another offer. So um, there are things that many, uh, Many features of the of the offer uh, of of the place uh, can inform how much is going to eventually be sold for. Okay, so it's the pictures, the location too, and and things about the buyer uh, itself. So the next slide, next slide, please. So um, so this is usually how, how this works, and you, you get uh, the data, you, well, you formulate a problem, you get the data. In the case of Zillow, they get you know, hundreds of thousands of data points where you have, this is the house, uh, and this is the location, this is a picture, and then they try to predict you know, a two-week process, how, will, uh, how much this house will be sold for. And that's what they call a Zestimate. Okay? So you deploy the model, but then there are all these processes where you have to tune the model, you have to deploy it, make it available for, for the users, which in this case is just Zillow, but you can make it available for other companies. And then you have to monitor. Maybe it's making some mistakes, or you have to update it. So next slide, please. Now, um, in data science, um, we usually don't think too much about these things when you, when you are teaching in, in an environment like this in the university. Uh, but I try to, well, we try to teach it here in the school. There is all this, uh, this infrastructure around building these models. So not just uh, getting the data, but it's also the deployment of the, of, the, um, of, the, of the models. So you have to create APIs, you have to create versions, and also you have to monitor things. And this has become very important in, in, the, in the recently because you might have uh, you know, biases. You might, have, you might be breaking the law because you are, maybe you're taking the zip code in, in, the prediction, uh, okay, in the prediction of the value and you know, without you realizing uh, in the US at least, uh, you know, areas of certain cities are very segregated, so the zip code might, uh, in some sense, be informing the, the prediction and making all kinds of uh, bias predictions about that. So next slide, please. So, um, so data science is this kind of role that kind of feels that is like a full stack, full stack data mining role that goes from, you know, getting the data, having a little bit of domain expertise, uh, developing the model, fine tuning them, and then uh, deploying them and, and uh, monitoring them. So here is a survey of how much time people spend on, diff on all of these um, tasks uh, in data science. And you know, me uh, building the model and thinking about these things uh, is just a, a, a tiny fraction of, of the rest. You need to explore the data, load it, uh, uh, deploy it, and, and, um, and clean the data. So next slide, please. All right, so how is, what, what is deep learning? What's, what's going on here? So because this talk is about deep, uh, applied deep learning. 
So what's happened is that uh, in the past, you could do the things that I show you. You can say, okay, I have this data set, and I can kind of skip the middle man and make, or the middle woman, and make a prediction about, the, say, the, this, the price of house. But what has happened over the last uh, 10 years, I would say, or maybe even five years, is that in the past, let's say, if you look at this cartoonish plot of how big the models have been in the past, like these, these models that take the features and make the prediction, how much computational power you need to make the predictions. What has happened is that in the past, things were like slowly in, uh, increasing in size, in computational power, okay? Uh, uh, but around 12, 2012, there was a, a break in that trend, in that to now get predictions that were really good, you needed to start increasing the amount of power that you put into this model by much more. And what, what happened there in 12, 2012 was the introduction of this idea of deep learning. Okay, and I will explain what that means. But basically, now for your, your organization to take advantage of these kinds of models, um, you need much bigger and complicated models, more data, more computational power. So I will suggest that you look at this economist article from OpenAI that goes through this idea. So next slide, please. So okay, so what is deep learning? So if you think about it, artificial intelligence is a very broad goal of trying to reproduce intelligence, like we, what we all think is intelligence in, the, in, the, uh, in nature, uh, virtually or artificially in, in a machine. So that's a very broad goal that has both like technical implications and applied implications, but also has philosophical implications. Now, if you, if you look, uh, if you kind of specialize more, you can think of uh, machine learning where you're trying to use data to uh, build models that learn from that data and improve future performance. So you want to take you know, the zero data sets and, and make a prediction so that you reduce the error between the, uh, the asking price, uh, sorry, the selling price and the actual prediction that you're making about the price of the house. So that's a very standard thing that's been going on for 50 years. But now deep learning is a, is a more specialized form of machine learning which you're using a specific kind of model for making such prediction. And the specific kind of model is based on how the brain works, or at least is inspired by how the brain works, and more specifically about how neuron, neural networks work in the brain. So um, here's my favorite kind of structure that we have in the brain. This is from the visual system. When you are looking at something, let's say you're detecting food, or maybe you're uh, trying to look for a place without snow, you, um, you are uh, looking with your eyes, and you can think of, of the eyes kind of capturing the input from the environment. And what's cool about the visual system in the brain is that that light that goes in through the eye uh, hits an area, the primary visual uh, area of your brain, and that area, through various uh, experiments in neuroscience, we have determined that they compute like little features about the environment, like little, uh, you know, um, borders, little uh, colors, like very simple things. Okay, so the, the first thing that the, that the brain computes are like these very simple features about the environment. What's cool is that once you start stacking this area, once this, the primary visual system sends the signal, what it detected, these borders, into the next area, the next area then combines those features hierarchically. So you get, air, you get things now that are more like shapes. Instead of just being borders, it's more like okay, how many squares there are, how many circles. And then you keep going up and up until at some point there is an area in the brain where there is a neuron that will fire if you see you know, a delicious uh, sandwich or you see you know, no snow or something like that. So there is this hierarchical structure where you start detecting simple things and it goes all the way up to very complex concepts, faces, and things like that. So um, artificial neural networks try to re reproduce that in the computer by creating, uh, by extracting the, the three basically simple concepts. The concept of a neuron, which is a, something that receives an input or a set of inputs, and it makes a very simple computation. The other concept is that that output of the, of the neuron connects to other neurons. And the third concept is that that connection usually is through layers. So you have layers of neurons that connect to the next layer of neurons, and you don't really have connections within a layer. Next slide, please. So here I'm showing you an artificial neural network. I'm taking this from uh, uh, three, uh, three Blue, One Brown, a great YouTube channel. So um, 
And this is a classic uh, example of how a neural network learns to detect digits. Okay, so the input for this network is an image of 28 by 28 pixel, grayscale image, and the output is a label that says, okay, the, I think this, new, uh, this number is number two, this number is number nine, and so on and so forth. And here I have a very simple, fully, what's called a fully collected neural network. This is artificial, so the inputs are the pixels, and then I have two hidden layers. And I just initialize the network to just having random, random weights. So it starts randomly, and it starts just guessing. So you pass the pixels, and it makes a prediction. And then what's cool about this is that we make the network so that it's differentiable. So we can compute the difference in error that will make if I change any of the connections in my network. Okay, so through a process called, called forward propagation, we compute the errors that we're making, and then we can back propagate those errors to fix the neuron. Okay, so through this process, just by showing examples and labels, show example and labels, the network will start learning. And the idea of deep neural network is that now we've gone through just two neurons, I mean two layers, you can see these layers here, up to now we are like 100 layers, and that's what's called, that's what's called deep. And the deeper you go, the more sophisticated the features are. So next slide, please. Now what I've seen is that uh, in the past, um, to apply these kinds of models, you needed you know, very specialized knowledge. You needed to know uh, some, special, some obscure parts of, of the language to implement these neural networks yourself. But what has happened over the last five years is that there are all these packages, PyTorch, TensorFlow, MXNet, that allow you to, anybody really, any organization, to take these uh, models and apply them to any data set they have. So, and it's uh, all very standard, and it's backed by big companies like Facebook, Google, and Amazon. And there is infrastructure now for taking these models and deploying them on the cloud. So there is all this, this kind of support that allows you to use these kinds of technologies in your data set. So next slide, please. So what is now what's applied deep learning? Because deep learning could be research. You kind of are developing new kinds of architectures. Uh, you are processing new kinds of data. But applied deep learning is really just taking what other people or other organizations have done, not really creating a new architecture, by taking these little pieces and combining them. So you might want to connect, combine you know, images with texts, and you might want to combine those things. So applied deep learning is really this idea that you can take uh, the big data set that you have, you can use them, you have a storage for, uh, for storing the data that you want to learn from, you have access to GPUs to big computational uh, power, power infrastructures, and you have access to these much sophisticated models and, and methods of training these systems. So here I'm showing you an example of something that would have been crazy 10 years ago, or maybe, uh, maybe 20 years ago, where um, this is a classic task in, in computer vision where you want to detect objects that are present in an image. So you take a picture and you want to see if there are people there, dogs, uh, you know, if there are uh, you know, cars and things like that. So something that would have taken you know, a couple of PhDs to to, to build, now it takes like two lines of code in Python. Okay, so you can use something like PyTorch and say, uh, which is a, a package uh, backed by Google, and you can say, okay, take this model that was developed by Google, it cost them you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to train them on millions of images, take that, download it, and then I'm gonna detect based on an image that I have in my organization, I'm gonna detect the objects that are inside. Okay, so that makes it very easy for any organization to use this. So next slide, please. So let me see, let's review a couple of applications of this. So, uh, well, healthcare, I think, is, a, is an obvious application because many, many processes in healthcare, you think about them, about them, they involve, you know, a doctor making a decision, usually a visual inspection of some sort, of, a, of an exam. Okay, so here's an example of uh, cancer detection in, in skin cancer. And, um, so if you think about it, for a doctor to make the decision of whether, let's say, a mold is suspicious, and maybe you need to do like a biopsy, um, they uh, have to they have to train, right? They go to med, med school, and uh, in somewhere there is a, like a cancer class, let's say, and they show different pictures. This, uh, this is a normal mold. Is like, you know, the borders are even and it's not growing, and the color is like brownish, but color, uh, clear brown. So uh, these are fine, and then these are 
These are not fine. These are like irregular. They're growing in size. The color is a little darker. So this, you should pay attention to this. Okay, so the, 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 uh, the dermatologist will, will learn this separation of these two classes and it will make a decision. Once it's in the practice, it will, it will look at a, a, a skin of someone and say, oh, I think this is, based on my experience, this doesn't look right. So maybe we need to do a follow-up. Now, because we have huge data sets, and here this is work that was published a couple of years ago in Nature. They took data from UK. They have the National Health uh, System, I think it's called. Uh, so they have hundreds of thousands of, of images, and they have the expert opinion of a dermatologist. They can feed these images through computer vision uh, deep learning systems that can make the prediction from the image, just the raw pixels, into saying this is OK and this is not OK. okay? And this, uh, these kinds of networks are called convolutional neural networks. And the idea is that you pass these filters through uh, the image. And as I was saying before, they, the first kind of filters detect simple features like borders and things like that. But then once you move up in the hierarchy, they start detecting more sophisticated things like irregular borders or colors and things like that. Um, now here what I'm showing is, is the kind of the true positive rate, the false positive, the kinds of mistakes that the dermatologists are making. And the, the closer you are to, to here, to this corner, the better, okay? And all these dots here just show different dermatologists, where they are located, what kind of errors they're making. And what's cool is that this deep learning network actually is making, in general, less mistakes compared to the experts. And on average, this is the average here. I don't know if you can see it on the screen. There is a, really, a, a little uh, green dot. The average from many, many dermatologists is lower in performance than, uh, than a computer vision system. Now, there are many caveats. There have been many follow-ups of this research, so it's not completely 100% true because the data set wasn't like completely okay and there was, a lot of, there was a lot of overfitting. But in general, we see this. Like, we see the performance of computer vision systems approaching human performance. Okay, so next slide, please. Um, now, the applications of this, you know, it's really just, this, this is just one application with cancer research. But you can think of something like precision medicine where we're trying to, to produce um, uh, a program for each individual, right? So we're trying to produce a treatment program based on the particular history of each individual. So if you think about medicine over the last 50 years, because of time and because of expenses, we kind of have these rules of what we should do with certain uh, symptoms. This is, we should do this uh, because, you know, this is what applies to most people. So in general, on average, this is good. But for individuals, it might be very different. So the treatment might be very specialized. So precision medicine tries to make that. Now, in the past, to do precision medicine, you will need a team of doctors looking at a case and kind of tweaking the treatment of, for the person. But what we could do, we could take an AI system, and we can take data from previous judgments uh, on individual cases and say, OK, Given these symptoms, what should be the treatment for that, this particular person? So we can include uh, AI into that to make that, uh, that prediction for each individual. So next slide, please. Um, so recently there was, uh, I, guess, I guess this year, there was this breakthrough on another uh, kind of problem, which is protein folding. Uh, it turns out that a lot of the functionality in our brain, in our brain, in our body and in our brains is made by these proteins that are just sophisticated machines that move inside cells that are 3D structures and they perform various tasks. They're like mini machines. Okay, so if you see them live, it's, it's pretty fascinating. Five minutes, okay, good. So um, now the idea is that there are all these, these uh, we don't really understand how the, 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 this 3D structure is computed from the, um, from the initial encoding of the of the uh, of this protein, so we need um, it will be great to understand how that how that process goes. And and I guess this year there was this deep learning uh, technique that took the sequence of amino acids and predicted very accurately, much more accurately than any 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 before uh, anyone before the structure of the of the protein. Okay, so if I can move. Uh, here. Now there are more like cute applications of these technologies. So if you uh, use uh, Instagram, there are all these filters that you can apply. There are these very sophisticated deep, deep learning techniques 
that allow you to parse an image, to parse a face, and detect where the uh, where the eyes are and things like that. And you can, and then based on that, they and they run really fast at 30 frames per second, and they can start you know understanding the the uh, 3D structure of a face, and then put um, you know different kinds of uh, of things on top of it. There are all uh, other apps that, that can reverse uh, age you. They can make you younger or older uh, because they have learned the progress of a, the image of someone. Um, translation, if you speak another language, you've seen the tremendous progress in translation, the same thing, because they have these massive data sets and they can learn and do equally well almost to a translator. Now, in my own research, I, I, I use this model, so with text, Analysis, I, I, I'm using at, uh, these models, BERT, for example, a, a big model for processing text. I'm also processing images, and it's just a re remarkable how well I can tell uh, the location of, of pieces of images, of graphs, and detect whether they're trying to mislead uh, other scientists. So I'm going to move. Now, this is a cool um, new development where we have these huge models that are trained on different tasks, and these are called foundation models. And this is the latest and greatest, and you can read more about this. Uh, just Google foundation models, and it's the next iteration of deep learning. So I wanted to finish by kind of um, by kind of warning that uh, the problem with these models, deep learning models, is that they hide a lot of biases. So here's an example, a really nasty example of a bias that was hidden in an API in Google. So if you if you painted the hands differently. The model was guessing that you know, a white hand was holding a monocular, whereas a black hand was holding a gun. So what happens with these models is that they're so complicated that it's, it's unclear how it's making the decision. So it's really hard to inspect what's going on inside. So I highly recommend uh, this book that goes through many of these examples. OK, and um, with that, I will finish. Uh, we have research in our own lab where we have similar things, where some uh, text uh, techniques are biased against women and against minorities, so we have to be, in general, careful about apply deep learning. OK, so with that, I'll finish. So thank you very much. So maybe just one or two quick questions. Um, yeah. And also, it's a nice segue to the next talk. So you talked about ethics. The whole next talk is actually going to talk about ethics Great. as well. Um, there's a question that came up. Uh, you mentioned skin cancer detection. And I actually talked about that even yesterday. So it's a pretty common one to talk about. Um, does that work equally well depending on your color of your skin or not? No, actually, that's a great question. So it has real, real trouble with darker skins. Uh, that's, a, that's a problem that uh, is across computer vision. And, and because the examples that, they, that these systems have are, are biased, and most of the examples are of certain ethnicities, um, and they're from the UK, so it's already biased. So uh, my understanding is that it doesn't work too well with dark skin. And one last question. Um, so under what circumstances is deep learning better than traditional machine learning algorithms? Or maybe another way to say that is, under what circumstances are traditional machine learning algorithms still useful? Yeah, there, I think you should definitely always try traditional machine learning algorithms. Deep learning works mostly when you have a lot of data already, or when somebody else trained uh, these foundation models in a bigger data set. So if you have small data sets, or it's very noisy, uh, definitely don't go with deep learning, just uh, it will overfit your data.